Keys turn all electronic devices, all electronic devices to vibrate. Will all non-council employees, non-council employees, please leave the main floor of the chambers? Thank you. Members, please have their seats. Members, please have their seats. <clears throat> Thank you. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Roll call. <clears throat> Adams. Present. Amprey Samuel. Present. Ayala. Present. Barron. Present. Borelli. Brannon. Cabrera. Chin. Here. Cohen. Constantinides. Present. Cornegy. Present. Deutsch. Present. Diaz. Aki. Drum. Espinal, Eugene, Gibson, Jonai, Grudenchik, Holden, Kalos, King, Ku. Koslowitz, Lanceman, Kalos, Lander, Levin, Levine, Mizell, Menchaca, Presente. Cohen, Miller, Moya, Perkins, Powers, Reynoso, Richards, Present, Rivera, Present. Rodriguez. Here. Rose. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Here. Malone. Here. Van Bramer. Here. Williams. Jaeger. Here. Matteo. Cumbo. Present. Gibson. Present. Speaker Johnson. <clears throat> Quiet in your chambers. All rise for the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by Bishop Calvin Rice of New Jerusalem Worship Center at 12205 Smith Street in Jamaica, New York. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
quiet in the chambers. Good afternoon to everyone. May we pray. Dear Lord of heaven and of earth, maker and ruler of all things, we the benefactors of your goodness and your grace that is renewed every single day, each and every day, humbly express our sincere and profound thanks for all things nature has provided for us to sustain life. We are grateful for the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat. Thank you for the intellect to produce man-made comforts of clothing and shelter and all things necessary to sustain a bountiful life. I pray this afternoon that you would grant this governing body divine wisdom to legislate laws and ordinances that would enhance and protect the lives of all the people in every borough, in every neighborhood. Give these councilmen and councilwomen a spirit of unity and purpose to make our city a light to the world, the melting pot of culture and diversity, working and living as one people. We ask this in the name of the God of our faith, amen. Please be seated. Bishop. A motion to spread the invocation on the record. Council member Adrian Adams. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Bishop Calvin Rice has served as the senior pastor of the New Jerusalem Worship Center in Jamaica, New York, since January 2005. Before going to New Jerusalem, Bishop Rice served for 20 years as senior pastor of the First Central Baptist Church of Staten Island, where he grew FCBC from 35 to more than 2,000 members. He also founded the First Central Housing Development Corporation, which restored two residential buildings and converted an abandoned supermarket into a 15,000 square feet family life community center. In addition, he served as the executive director of Staten Island Communities United, a not-for-profit charged with distributing $2.5 million in funding to five communities on the North Shore under a New York State Family Preservation Grant. During his tenure in Jamaica, Queens, Bishop Rice has successfully led the effort to complete a $9 million construction project on the church. In addition to completing the church building project, which doubled the size of the facility, the membership and attendance has increased by 40%. Bishop Rice also founded and serves as the CEO of the Rochdale Early Advantage Charter School, a pre-K through grade five publicly funded education institution housed in the lower level and administration wing of the New Jerusalem Worship Center complex. The school, which opened in 2010, has a current enrollment of 319 students and was recently listed as a reward school, an honor given to only 155 schools in the entire state of New York. Bishop Rice is currently planning a $5 million expansion to increase the enrollment to 430. Bishop Rice has served as a member of Mayor Bloomberg's Economic Development Task Force and Staten Island Borough President's Anti-Bias Task Force. He received the recognition from the New York Association of Black and Puerto Rican Legislators for his community and economic development work. Most recently, Bishop Rice was awarded the Vernon M. Doherty Distinction in Ministry Award, the highest honor granted by the New Theological Seminary's alumnus. He has received countless proclamations from the governor of New York, three New York City mayors, two United States senators, and five New York City council members. Bishop Rice has held more than 12 board positions and served as chairman of four. He has been featured in more than 30 newspaper and magazine articles and has received more than 75 awards and honors for his work, including the coveted Living the Dream Award from the American Broadcasting Company. In 1994, Bishop Rice was inducted into the Staten Island College Hall of Fame and was the first living African American to have a New York City street in the borough of Staten Island named in his honor. He has preached throughout the United States of America, Canada, the Middle East, and South Africa. 
He has licensed and ordained 40 sons and daughters in ministry, including two who currently serve as senior pastors. Bishop Rice is a New York State certified chaplain and served for 22 years as Protestant chaplain at the South Beach Psychiatric Center in Staten Island. Bishop Rice's academic achievements include a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the College of Staten Island and a Master's of Professional Studies from the New York Theological Seminary. He completed graduate studies at the National Theological Seminary of Baltimore, Maryland and the Postgraduate Center for Mental Health of New York City in conjunction with Hebrew Union Seminary. He has also attended the Catawba Bible College of Rock Hill, South Carolina and holds a certificate of study from the Hebrew University, Jerusalem, Israel. He is married to the former Willie Mae Rogers and together they have three children and five grandchildren. I am honored to call Bishop Calvin Rice my friend and one of the most revered spiritual leaders, not just in Queens, but in all of New York City and beyond. Bishop, in behalf of council members Richards, Miller, and myself, and the entire New York City Council, we are honored and grateful for your selfless dedication and service, and we thank you for giving us today's blessing. Madam Public Advocate, I move to spread the invocation in full upon the record. So moved, and I join in those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Adoption of minutes, Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Good afternoon, colleagues. I make a motion that the minutes of the stated meeting of August 29th, 2018 and September 12th, 2018 be adopted and printed. Thank you. Thank you. Messages and papers from the mayor. Pre-considered M104, TLC appointment. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. Oops. Uh, rules, privileges, and elections on messages and papers from the mayor and rules, privileges, and elections from communication from city, county, and borough offices. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's pre-considered M105, a planning commission appointment. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. M106 through M108. Uh, coupled on a call-up vote, and at this time I'd ask for a roll call vote on all of the items on today's land use call-ups. We are just voting on land use call-ups now. Adams. Aye on all. Ampre Samuel. Aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Barron. I vote aye. Borelli. Brannon. Cabrera. Aye. Chin. Aye. Cohen. Aye. Constantinidis. Aye on all. Cornegy. Aye on all. Deutsch. Aye. Diaz. Drum. Aye. Espinal. Eugene. Aye. Gibson. Jonai. Aye and all. Gordenchik. Aye. Holden. Aye and all. Kalos. Aye and all. King. Aye and all. Mario. Aye. Ku. Aye. Kozlowitz. Aye. Lanceman. Lander. Aye. Levin. Aye. Levine. Aye. Mizell. Yes. Menchaca. Aye. Miller. Aye. Moya. Perkins. Powers. Aye. Reynoso. Reynoso. Gibson. Madam Public Advocate, I'd like permission to vote on all land use call-ups and general order calendars. Yes. Thank you. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Richards. Aye. Borelli. Aye. Rivera. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Aye on all. Salamanca. Aye. Torres. Traeger. Aye. Ulrich. Valone. Van Bramer. Aye. Williams. Aye. Jaeger. Aye. Combo. Aye. 
Speaker Johnson. Today's land use call-ups are adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, zero negative. Quiet in the chambers, please. As we now hear from the speaker, Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. It is nice to uh, see you up there uh, on the dais. And uh, it may not be for much longer, so we're really grateful to have you here uh, today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Shh. Uh, today, we celebrate our truths. A few of us here in the council shared our stories last week on National Coming Out Day. It was not easy for all of us, but it is important to show the next generation of LGBT individuals that they are not alone and that we stand in solidarity with them. It is also important that those of us here who are allies of LGBT people reinforce our commitment to creating a safe and welcoming environment for the LGBT community and their families and friends and colleagues. I want to thank everyone who's wearing a rainbow ribbon today for your support. It means the world to all of us here in the LGBT caucus. And of course, there are five members of the caucus, Councilmember Van Bramer, Councilmember Drum, Councilmember Torres, Councilmember Menchaca, and myself. And I want to thank LGBT Network uh, CEO David Kilnick for supplying us with these ribbons. I'm not going to stand here today and uh, tell you my whole story, but I will just say that uh, National Coming Out Day is not just a moment for LGBT people to come out and share their story and talk about the adversity that they faced and how they came to come out and accept their themselves and live their lives. It's also an opportunity for other people to come out about things that have been difficult for them to talk about in their own lives that have nothing to do with their sexual orientation. And what we saw, even from some members of this council and, of course, from members of the public, is that day being used as an opportunity to talk about difficult things that involve shame and adversity, but to use it as an occasion to inspire others I stand here today as Speaker of the Council from a path that had me as a despondent, clinically depressed, suicidal 15-year-old boy in a small town of 3,000 people 30 miles north of Boston, never dreaming that I would leave that small town and never knowing I would end up in this great city or knowing that I would even run for office or knowing that I would become Speaker of this august and important body. But I didn't do that on my own and I didn't get here on my own. I am here today because of all of the people that came before me to lay the groundwork and clear the path to make that possible, and I think that Jimmy, Danny, Carlos, and Richie would say the same things. We stand on the shoulders of all of those who came before us, whether it be Tom Duane, who was the first openly gay member of the city council, and he was openly HIV positive in the early 1990s, when people were dying of AIDS in this city, or it be Bayard Rustin, who lived at Penn South in my district and organized the March on Washington for Dr. King, or Audre Lorde, or Sylvia Rivera, or Marsha P. Johnson, or Larry Kramer, all of those brave men and women who put their lives and bodies on the line before Stonewall, during Stonewall, after Stonewall, at the height of the AIDS epidemic, when people were dying, and when it was still legal in this city to discriminate and fire people just because they were gay. In 1986, this body went through a difficult chapter. And finally, there was a vote to codify discrimination not being allowed on the basis of sexual orientation. And people were screaming from the rafters here in this body. That passed in 1986, it took years, many years for it to pass. And at that moment in time, there was not an LGBT member of the city council to be able to stand here on the floor and debate that bill and talk about the real life impact it was having on the lives of LGBT New Yorkers. Times have changed. We have five LGBT members of the council. We're down a little bit from the previous term. 
And I stand here today as an openly gay, openly HIV positive man who is only able to stand here because of the hard work and activism of all of those who came before me and who came before us. So this rainbow that we are wearing, this ribbon, is not merely a token of visibility. It is a thread that shares the longer, deeper, important story that has allowed many of us to be able to be here today, to stand here proudly and openly to talk about ourselves, our struggle, and our story. And there are still many people in New York City, there are still many children who struggle with their sexual orientation, who are still bullied in school, who are still rejected by their parents and end up on the streets and subways of New York City without a roof over their head. We are the lucky ones, the ones who get to stand here today, but there are still too many people who are not as fortunate. And so I know the members of this caucus and the members of this body seek to make this a city that every person, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, or race, or gender, ethnicity, or religion, is able to be someone who lives with dignity and protection and value in our city. We talk about this today, even though it's not National Coming Out Day, that was last week, but we talk about this from a personal place. Many of our paths could have gone a different way if one person had potentially treated us differently. And so I want to thank all of you for your commitment to our city, the best city in the world, the most diverse city in the world, the city where 40% of the people living here were not born in the United States of America, the city that was the birthplace of the modern LGBT rights civil, civil rights movement, the city that has been a huge part of the worldwide struggle for equality for all people, not just LGBT people. The women's suffrage movement, the Underground Railroad, all of it started to happen here in our great city. And I want to recognize all of those brave men and women, those who are in this room, those who are not, dead or alive, that put themselves and their bodies on the line to make this possible for someone like me, who was a 15-year-old boy contemplating taking my own life in a small town, not knowing a single other openly gay person. We do this on their shoulders, we do this in their name, and we do it in their spirit. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I would like to uh, dedicate... Today, I'd like to dedicate our thoughts and prayers to a few New Yorkers, Felipe Torres, Felipe Torre, an FDNY medic who succumbed to 9-11 related cancer this past week. He was 54 years old, a medic who was working at Ground Zero to help other New Yorkers, died of cancer. Our thoughts and prayers are with his children and friends and everyone at the fire department in New York City. Shaquem Farnham, who was killed in an accident while driving the forklift in a food distribution center in Hunts Point last week, last month. Shaquem was 43 years old. Luis Amante, a 47-year-old worker who died at the scene of a wall collapse at a construction site, Sunset Park, and. Councilman Menchaca's district. I know Councilman Menchaca was there on the scene that day, tending to the family. Juan Otoya, a Queens resident who was struck and killed by a construction vehicle at a building site on the Upper East Side. Juan was, 40, it was 66 years old. Brian Trinidad, a 27-year-old who was killed by a coworker in a fight in a Brooklyn warehouse where they worked. And finally, on Saturday, the NYPD added 43 names 
of fallen officers to its police memorial wall. The names included 24 officers who died from 9-11 related illnesses, 15 cops who died in the 20th century, and one officer who died in the 1869 ferry yard accident in Brooklyn. I think Police Commissioner James O'Neill said it best when he said, quote, their lives were spent and ultimately ended in great service to the city and the people they cared so much about. If all of us could stand for a moment of silence for all of those we are remembering today. Thank you very much. And it is actually quite fitting now, sad but fitting, sad for us but good for the city of New York, that I want to acknowledge that one of our assistant sergeant at arms, Mohammed Arshad, Mo, is leaving us that big smile, that friendly demeanor, that helpful presence, but he is leaving us to join the Police Academy in New York City. I get the chills saying it. I want to thank him so much. Whoever the next speaker is has to consider him for the detail. Okay, now the council is going to vote on the following land use items uh, today. Um, Lefferts Boulevard rezoning. It is in Council Member Adams' district, 95 Lenox Avenue. It's an Article 11 tax exemption to preserve affordable housing. In Council Member Perkins' district, Lutheran Social Services of New York Early Life Child Center in Councilmember Salamaka's district, the Borum Hill Historic District Extension in Councilmember Levin's district, and the 180 uh, Myrtle Avenue text amendment, I believe that is in Majority Leader Cumbo's district. I want to thank the land use staff who worked on these projects, Brian Paul, Jeff Yoon, and John Douglas, as well as our land use director, Raju Mann. Uh, the council is going to vote on the following legislation today. We'll vote on the parental empowerment package. We first announced this package of bills for Mother's Day, and we are very proud to be voting on these bills today. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but uh, too often uh, we can fall short in supporting parents and caregivers who are tending to children. Uh, this package of bills will help provide New York City families with exactly the type of support they need to raise healthy, happy families. I want to commend my amazing colleagues. I especially want to recognize uh, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who came to me with this package of legislation uh, maybe a week before Mother's Day and said we need to announce it on Mother's Day. So thank you for giving me a lot of time uh, to consider it then. And our incredible Women's Committee Chair, who's not here, Helen Rosenthal, uh, for her leadership uh, as well. Uh, they have been unwavering in their commitment to improving the lives of families across New York City. Introduction 913A, sponsored by Chair Rosenthal, will require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to submit a plan to increase access to doulas for uh, pregnant people in the city, including relevant timelines and strategies. The Health Department will also report annually on known city and community-based programs that provide doula services and training areas with a disproportionately high rate of maternal mortality, cesarean birth, and other poor birth outcomes in the city, and any updates to the plan. Uh, the next bill is also by Councilmember Rosenthal, Introduction 914A. It will expand upon the report required by Local Law 55 of 2017 and require the Health Department to submit additional data 
on maternal mortality, as well as information on severe maternal morbidity. The report will include more nuanced information, such as insurance status, trimester of prenatal care entry, and pre-existing health conditions. The bill will require the report to provide recommendations for enhancing agency cooperation to improve outcomes. And finally, this legislation will codify the multidisciplinary Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, known as M3RC, and require the Health Department to post online information on the disciplines represented in the M3RC committee. Introduction 879A, sponsored by Majority Leader Cumbo, will expand upon existing laws to require any employer with 15 or more employees to provide a lactation room with a surface to place a breast pump and require that room be a reasonable proximity from the employee's work area and also to have a refrigerator suitable for breast milk storage. Introduction 878A, sponsored by Council Member Robert Cornegie, will expand upon Local Law 94 of 2016, which was also his bill, which became law, which required lactation rooms in places like city health centers, requiring that city jails that accept visitors in police precincts offer lactation rooms for a police precinct or jail to provide a lactation room uh, due to security concerns of limited space if it's not practicable to have them. The bill will require those agencies provide an explanation why it's not practicable as well as information on any future plans to improve the availability of lactation rooms. Introduction 905A, sponsored by Councilwoman Carlina Rivera, will require employers to develop, implement, and distribute all new hires a written policy regarding the provision of a lactation room. The policy will include a statement that employees have the right to request a lactation room, identify the appropriate process for doing so, and provide guidance for what to do if two or more persons need the room at the same time. The bill will also require the New York City Commission on Human Rights to establish and post online a model lactation room accommodation uh, policy. I want to thank the staff who worked on all of these bills, Brenda McKinney, Austin Branford, Chloe Rivera, Smita Deshmukh, and Andrea Vasquez for their help in getting us this legislation. Introduction 853A, sponsored by our public advocate, Letitia James would require the establishment of a working group to study the feasibility of providing discounted group childcare services for children aged four and under of city employees. The working group would include experts in the field of childcare and agency representatives and would issue its feasibility report 12 months from when it signed into law. The study would be followed by a pilot project to provide such child care at one or more centers in the city. And I want to thank the public advocate for this very important bill that we're passing into law today. And then lastly, introduction 380A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, to make available a supply of diapers and baby wipes sufficient to meet the needs of children three years old and younger at domestic violence shelters, temporary shelters, family justice centers, life programs, and city contracted child care centers. It would also require visible signage or written notice of the availability of such diapers and baby wipes. It's such an important bill, Mark. I'm really glad we're passing it today. All the bills are. I want to thank the staff who worked on the Public Advocates Bill, as well as Councilmember Traeger's bill, uh, Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cronk, Zachary Harris, and Rachel Cordero. That concludes our agenda for today's Stated, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Thank you all very much for being here. And I also want to uh, tell everyone who celebrated the high holidays, I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season. With that, Madam Public Advocate, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Discussion of general orders, seeing none. Report of special committees. None. Reports of standing committees. Report. <clears throat> report. Report of the Committee on Governmental Operations, intros 380A and 853A child care bills. Amended and coupled in general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 208 and Reso 570 and LU 216 and Reso 571, zoning amendments. Coupled to general orders. LU 219 and Reso 572, landmark designation. Coupled to general orders. LU 220 and Reso 573, child care facility. Coupled to general orders. LU 223 and Reso 574 through LU 225 and Reso 576, Lennox Avenue Plan. Couple of general orders. Report of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections, preconsidered M104 and Reso 577, approving the appointment of Stephen Kest, Taxi and Limousine Commission. 
Couple to general orders. Pre-considered M105 and Reso 578, approving the appointment of Udashram Raj Ramprashad, City Planning Commission. Couple to general orders. Shh. Report of the Committee on Women. Intro, 878A, 879A, 905A, 913A, and 914A, Parental Empowerment Package. Amended and coupled to general orders. On the general order calendar. Intro 720, Laid site over. safety training. Laid over. Resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Coupled to general orders, and at this time, I'd ask for a roll call vote on all of the items on today's general order calendar. Quiet in the chambers, please. The first vote is Councilmember Rodriguez. Keep it down. Aye. Thank you. Adams. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. I would like to congratulate Raj Ramprashad, my former colleague, former chairperson of Community Board 9, on his appointment today. We are more than happy to have you with your background, your knowledge, and your heart for the community. Congratulations, Raj. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Ampri Samuel. I vote aye. Thank you. Ayala. Aye. Barron. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. I want to commend my colleagues for the legislation, particularly that concerning uh, mortality, uh, mortality rates and looking at those studies is really very important, especially in communities such as ours where the rates are the highest. In terms of the bills, I'm voting aye on all with the exception of LU 223, 224, and 225 and the accompanying resolutions. It's the same story that I've had before. If I could have parsed out the piece that would have uh, been Article 11 and separated it out, I would have done that, but it's a collective. And i looking at uh, Lot 155, described in that bill. 80% of the apartments there would be at 130% of AMI and market. So for those reasons, I'm abstaining on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Borelli. I and all accept M104 and the accompanying resolution. Brennan. I and all. Cabrera. I. Chin. I and all. Cohen. I. Constantinidis. With congratulations to all my colleagues on today's legislation. I vote I and all. Carnegie. Aye. Deutsch. Aye. Diaz. Aye. Drum. Aye. Eugene. Eugene. Jonai. Aye on all. Gordenchik. Uh, aye on all, Madam Public Advocate. I just want to add to uh, Councilwoman Adams' comments. I'm delighted to be uh, and urge all my colleagues to vote yes uh, for Raj Rampashad. I had the honor of working with him uh, when I was director of community boards for both uh, Borough President Marshall, God rest her soul, and Borough President Katz. And I congratulate Borough President Katz on this outstanding appointment. And with that, I and all. Thank you. Holden. I and all. Kalos. King. I and all. Ku. I and all. Kozlowitz. Be excused to explain my vote. I yes. also want to congratulate Raj. I also had the privilege of working with him as the community board director, as the uh, <coughs> deputy borough president, and as a council member. He was a great chair of community board nine and a great member to our community. So I want to congratulate Raj. I vote aye on all of the general couple daughters. Thank you. Landsman. Landsman. Lander. Permission to explain? Yes. Vote aye on all, and I just want to give a big shout out to Steve Kast, who's somebody who's really given his whole life to organizing workers and organizing communities and finding ways to make public policy work better for people. And I'm proud that we're uh, electing him today to serve on the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Levin. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, I just want to uh, congratulate the Borum Hill community on the expansion of the Borum Hill Historic District. Um, the Borum Hill community has uh, long been fighting to have more of their community protected by uh, landmark status, which um, it, with uh, forces of gentrification going on all around us and um, the incentives for 
um, new owners to come in and tear down non-landmark protected buildings, some of which have uh, historic significance. Um, it's important that we, uh, where we can and where appropriate, uh, extend landmark status to our communities that can preserve uh, this great uh, architectural heritage that we have throughout New York City. And, uh, and so I want to uh, thank the Landmarks Commission and the DeBus administration with, for working with us on this and, uh, and, and congratulate the Borham Hill Association and all the residents of Borham Hill that have, uh, came out to advocate for this. And with that, I vote aye on all. Amen. Thank you. Lansman. Aye. Levine. Aye. Mizell. Yes. Menchaca. Aye. Miller. Aye. Moya. Aye. Powers. Aye. Aye on all. Reynoso. Aye on all. Richards. Aye on all. Rivera. Aye on all. Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye on all. Salamanca. Aye on all. Torres. Aye on all. Traeger. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, colleagues, I, today we're voting on my bill, Introduction 380A, a law that provides diapers and baby wipes uh, to uh, our child care centers, to our homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters. Diapers and wipes are not a luxury item. These are an expensive necessity, and many families struggle to afford them. The cost of diapers can especially be, be a hardship for single parents. In New York State, infant care can account for 55% of a single parent's household income, and WIC and SNAP assistance cannot be used to pay for the cost of diapers. Studies also show that moms who struggle to afford diapers are more likely to have depression, and babies who are exposed to dirty diapers are at risk of developing potentially severe, long-lasting medical complications. Our city must show basic decency. Many child care centers do not allow infants to be dropped off without a supply of diapers, putting some parents in the in an unenviable position of being unable to go to work or school because they have nowhere to leave their child. Furthermore, these children are missing out on the early childhood programs that can be critical for their academic, social, and emotional development. I am very proud that our city is stepping up to make sure that diapers are available for our families. This is common sense legislation, and I'm proud that we're taking a major step to do right by our families. This is a historic day. I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson, all my colleagues for their support, Laura Popa, Jeff Baker, Brad Reed, Andrea Vasquez, Rachel Cordero, and Jason Goldman for their hard work. And finally, to my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, Eric Feinberg for their work as well. Thank you very much, my colleagues. I thank you for your support. Thank you. you and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Eugene. I vote aye. Ulrich. I vote aye on all, and I also want to congratulate my good friend and former constituent, Raj Ramprashad. Uh, Melinda Katz, our great bar president, could not have picked a better person to join the city planning commissioner. Again, I vote aye. Thank you. Valone. Aye on all. Thank you. Van Bramer. Aye on all. Williams. Aye on all, with the exception of LU 224 and company resolution, which I abstain. Jaeger. Aye on all, with the exception of LU 219, accompanying resolution 572, and M104, accompanying resolution 577, on which I abstain on those four items. Thank you. Matteo. No one, 104, and accompanying reso 577, aye on the rest. Combo. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. I was proud to bring forward today this Mother's Day package, which takes a comprehensive approach to empowering parents across New York City. As the mother of a 14-month-old, I know that Mother's Day is great with chocolates and roses and flowers and all of those, but what we really need, and we need those things too, but what we really need is real support. And today's package really gives moms and parents across New York City that support. In this day and age, in the city of New York, it is still very difficult to raise a child. 
In the 35th Council District, child care for an average 14-month-old runs at about $20,000 to $25,000 a year, if you can believe that. And we know that doula care makes the difference for so many mothers, particularly black and Latino women, if they had the appropriate care would be alive to see their children today. And we need to make sure that more women have access to post and prenatal care. We also know that breastfeeding, for me, breastfeeding for almost a year for my son was really difficult. The ability to have more spaces to do so really creates an environment where mothers know that they are able to breastfeed and that there is an environment that supports that. We also know, in closing, that so many women today, as I mentioned, black and Latino women, are still dying as they're giving birth. And we want to make sure that we recognize that black women's lives matter, that the mothers matter, that we do all that we can as a city to end this horrible epidemic that is so preventable. And I thank this body, this entire body, for recognizing that things like diapers and wipes and childcare are not frivolous, but are critical to the survival and well-being of families across the city of New York. And I proudly vote aye. And happy Mother's Day. You all are the rock stars. You get up every morning and you do it. You change the diapers. You pump the milk. You change your baby's clothes. Daddy's too. Yes, Donovan. And we make sure that we get it done every day and get out the house by 7.30, 8 o'clock every day. So I vote aye on all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council recalling Council Member Barron, clarification, Council Member Barron? On your vote? Yes, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Yeah. As I said in the beginning, um, I would have voted for Article 11. I've been told that it is separated out, so I am voting in favor of the Article 11, and I believe that's LU 225 and the accompanying resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on all. As they tabulate the votes, I just want to thank everyone for this bill that I've been a sponsor of, which will create a real process for studying and implementing on-site child care for New York's 600,000 municipal workers. It guarantees a real feasibility study with one year of implementation and a program bill with three. And I want to thank all of those who were involved. I particularly want to thank uh, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, Rosenthal, Cabrero, and all of the staff members, and particularly my staff, um, Barbara Sherman and Michelle Kim. And with that, we're ready with a vote. All items on today's general order calendar were adopted by a vote of 49 in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of M104 and accompanying resolution 577, which was adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, two in the negative, and one abstention, NL land use 223 and accompanying resolution 574, which was adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, zero negative, and one abstention, N land use 219 and accompanying resolution 574, which was adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, one negative, and zero abstentions, and land use 224 and resolution 575, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, zero negative, and two abstentions, and the revised land use call-ups vote is, the, excuse me, the revised land use call-up vote is 49 in the affirmative, zero negative. Gentlemen, are there any corrections as you huddle? Any corrections? That's it. Um, and now, introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to the committee as indicated on the agenda. Um, dis discussion of resolutions, seeing none. Uh, now general discussions, beginning with Council Member Andy King. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to commend everyone for passing legislation today. But I just want to make an announcement as an ambassador for the American Cancer Society, Real Men Wear Pink. I'm asking us all this week to give our respect and commitment as I've asked the men to wear their dousing their pink today because so many men suffer from breast cancer. This week has been declared since 2009 by Governor Cuomo and 40 other states as Male Breast Awareness Week, uh, Male Breast Cancer Awareness Week. And for all our men who have never gotten checked, I ask you to do so for your wives, for your children, just to make sure that you stay around 
because we want to make sure that our men are here to take care of our families and more importantly be a part of society. So if you haven't been checked today, get yourself checked and thank you all you all of my colleagues today who are wearing the color pink because real men do wear pink. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> thank you. Councilmember Kalos. Three years ago, this council responded to a deadly outbreak of Legionnaires' disease with an overhaul of regulations on the cooling towers where the Legionella bacteria grows. Today, I'm introducing two bills as part of a legislative package with Council Member and Speaker Corey Johnson, Health Chair Mark Levine, Council Members Amprey Samuels, Constantinides Torres, and Salmanca. These bills together will improve upon the inspection regime that we established in 2015. Last summer, a small cluster of Legionnaires in my district on the Upper East Side spurred us as a city to dig into how well those new regulations were working. We found there were increased inspections of cooling towers, but there was also widespread non-compliance of the new laws. An investigation of WNYC News, Sean Carlson and Lila Yunus, found that as of 2016, nearly half of the city's 1,000 cooling towers were out of compliance. As the Department of Health issues violations to bring towers into compliance. Many buildings with cooling towers are still failing to report the results of their inspections, leaving us to wonder if the inspections are occurring at all. And although inspections happen four times a year, they are only reported annually. When we do get results, they are often unreliable as towers may be cleaned the day before the inspection, which means we have no idea whether the tower was cleaned for the rest of the year. Uh, the first introduction was co-sponsored by Council Member Levine and Council Member Amprey Samuels. Uh, introduction 1150 would prohibit building owners from cleaning towers directly before an inspection is scheduled in tandem with other bills in the package that would require follow-up cleanings if towers are unclean and allow for surprise inspections. This bill would mean we're getting real results for where there are dangerous conditions and where towers are clean. We would incentivize businesses to keep their towers clean throughout the year, not just on inspection day. Uh, introduction 1149 would require the health department to send electronic notices 30 days prior to the date when a building needs to certify that its towers have been inspected. This note may include a pre-filled certification form when the building forgets to certify. We have no way of knowing whether the towers have been cleaned and inspected. This bill would ease that process for buildings with towers to ensure they know when they need to certify in order to comply with the law. It would send data to the health department as soon as inspections are done, four times a year instead of only through the annual certification. I want to thank Legislative Council Sarah List for her work on these bills and this important package. Thank you. Council Member Koo. Thank you. Uh, I rise today to ask my colleagues to join me in signing on three uh, introductions. The first one, intro 11551, uh, will require the publication of machine readable versions of New York City construction codes including amendments. Currently, the various codes are spread out online, and if you want to buy the 2014 New York City Building Code, just one book, you will need to spend $155 at the city store. My next two bills deal with protecting New, York, uh, New Yorkers from cybersecurity attacks. In March, we, the world watched as the Atlanta as Atlanta was hit with a large ransomware cyber attack which shut the city down for five days. My bill, intro 1153, co-sponsored by Councilmember uh, Rivera, would require electronic system penetration testing protocols and security briefings and reports. This is to make sure that we are uh, ready to defend against attacks uh, to defend against attacks against our system. The last introduction, 1152, will protect New Yorkers in case our systems ever go down. Uh, intro 1152 will create an online payment grace period in the event of an electronic security system breach lasting more than 24 hours. New Yorkers will have a 48 hours grace period to make their payments after the system goes down, uh, go after the system go back up where low late fees could be charged. I ask my colleagues to please sign on to this uh, free uh, pieces of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cumbo. I just wanted to quickly thank Gail Black and Monica Abend on my staff who worked tirelessly on the Mother's Day package, and I just wanted to acknowledge their work. My office has um, 
we have welcomed 10 babies into the world um, in my five years, and so having a staff with children has been very meaningful and inspirational and informative in much of the, much of the legislation we've brought forward today. Thank you. Congratulations, Majority Leader. Be fruitful and multiply. Uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. <laughs> Councilmember Adams, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Approximately 800,000 people are trafficked across international borders each year, 50% of which are minors. In an effort to combat human trafficking, I've introduced Resolution 561, urging the U.S. Department of Education to provide basic training for school administrators, teachers, and staff in order to recognize the warning signs and risk factors of human trafficking. This legislation would ensure that New York City remains at the forefront of best practices in public education alongside California, Virginia, and North Carolina, all of which have passed laws that mandate training in trafficking prevention. Today, I'm also proud to introduce Intro 1137. This bill will codify into the New York City Charter the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. This office is New York City's Objective Intelligence Center, allowing the city to aggregate and analyze data from across city agencies to more effectively address crime, quality of life issues, and public safety. This office is a valuable tool for, for the New York City Council, helping us to be more robust in our work. While the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics was created by executive order under Mayor Bloomberg, we must ensure that this office survives success successive mayoral administrations. I'd like to thank our legislative division and my legislative coordinator, Stacey Yearwood, for all their efforts, and I urge my colleagues to sign on and support both of these very important pieces of legislation. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you. Councilmember Rose? Thank you. My, my colleagues, today is bittersweet because today is the last stated meeting for my PB coordinator and legislative aide, Issa Rogers. Many of you know her by her smile and her willingness to help. Later this month, she will be joining New York Foundling. I met Issa one weekend five years ago when I needed to exchange my phone, and she gave me not only good advice and a new phone, but her resume also. She came here as an intern. She helped to organize my 2013 campaign and formally joined my team after the election. I'm really sad to have her leave because I do not like change, and she is like one of the family. But I'm so proud of how she has grown and developed as a professional over the last five years. And I know that New York Foundling is very, very lucky to be getting her. We will miss her energy, her smile, and her competent execution of her responsibilities. Issa, here at the Council, we never say goodbye, but farewell until we meet again. Aviento, Avida Sain, Arriva Durche, Non Vemos, and Masalema. Go with God's speed, Isa. We will miss you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll miss you, Lisa. Councilmember Rivera. Thank you. First, I want to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues for voting on my bill intro 905. I want to thank my staff, especially Jeremy Unger and, of course, the speaker's team. Um, this bill, as mentioned, would require that employers establish lactation accommodation policies and post them in the workplace, just as they would for any other right that an employer is due to provide. So if we're going to be the fairest city in America, we must continue to pass legislation that addresses the financial and career inequities that women face in accessing quality health care and child care, including providing lactation areas. Women still face stigma for nursing in the workplace, even though state and federal law permits nursing in public. This leads to challenges for working mothers to find the time and the private space to breastfeed. So I'm proud that our package of bills moved through the City Council and that these and other issues women face in the workplace um, just continues to get a spotlight in the City Council as we move one step closer to really codifying laws that I think that are important for equality. 
So these laws in this package are taking care of not just women, but the health of all New York families. And I'm really proud that we as a council are treating family planning and parenthood as a priority. So I want to thank, uh, I also want to call on my council colleagues to support two new bills I'm introducing today. The first bill is intro 1160, 1163 will require holders of DOT permits allowing construction or equipment on city streets to preserve any impacted bike lanes with a safe and sufficient detour. These kinds of lane closures are not just an inconvenience to cyclists, they are a public safety hazard to all New Yorkers. This bill will prevent cyclists from being forced suddenly into pedestrian or vehicular traffic without notice and instead give them a detour that includes safe protective barriers. The second bill will help keep uh, council members and community leaders informed about public hearings and notices for the districts. Intro 1162 would require the director and deputy director of the city record to send an electronic mail notification to relevant parties. So we all know how inconvenient and what a disservice it is to our neighborhoods when they don't receive adequate notice. And it's so important to keep our communities informed. And I think that's just a benefit to all of us. So I invite you to sign on and I hope you will join me in supporting these important efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Miller. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Um, first of all, let me congratulate um, Majority Leader Cumbo and the others uh, on the pa important package of legislation that support working families. I happen to have been a, a working dad who supported and raised two children. And uh, also, um, on, on behalf of a public advocate, thank you so much for uh, the work on 853 and supporting public and municipal workers. And that uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I was the president and business agent of the Amalgamated Transit Union, which was the first municipal union in the country to have child care program. And it is so important that nearly 20 years, 15 years later, that we are, this struggle still exists, that we have not addressed the needs of working families. And this, this package is certainly a step, a positive step in the right direction to ensuring that we continue to value our workforce and our future workforce. Uh, today, I will also be introducing intro 1160. It is a, uh, it will require all cyclists under the age of 18 to wear a helmet. Now, we have carefully crafted this legislation so that there are provisions in the bill that require parents to be uh, available and other measures so that young folks in communities that have been disproportionately violated will not continue to do so. But uh, considering the dangers and what we have seen in terms of cycle accidents, this is important legislation and I hope that my colleagues would support it. Also, Resolution 566, myself and Council Member Drum are uh, introducing this resolution uh, for the state and for the governor to pass, which would require that um, automatic uh, re uh, enrollment uh, to the retirement system for uh, workers after 90 days unless they affirmatively opt out. There are employees who have gone their whole 20 to 25 year careers and not affirmatively belong to the system and it makes it impossible for them to receive the pension that they've worked so tirelessly for. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you. Council Member Steve Levine. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, I just want to call my colleagues' attention to intro 1156, which I'm introducing with Council Member Rafael Espinal. Um, this is uh, to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to report on the multi-agency response to community hotspots operation, otherwise known as MARCH. If you don't know what MARCH is, it's probably for good reason because it operates in the bureaucratic shadows of New York City. It's a multi-agency task force. Uh, they bring together the police department, the Department of Buildings, uh, sometimes the state liquor authority, sometimes the fire department, and, uh, and, they, and they do raids on businesses. And uh, they are done without any notice. Um, and you can be, it could be at one o'clock in the afternoon, it could be at one o'clock in the morning, you never know. And uh, your business could be basically raided by a multi-agency and we have no oversight over it. Um, we don't know how many times they have done these. We don't know how they determine uh, where they're going to go. We don't know uh, how, what, if you're on the march list, how to get off the march list. Um, and so this bill would bring some transparency and some sunlight uh, to uh, the march 
op operations, um, and we get a good sense, hopefully, from this legislation of how they're actually doing uh, their business. I want to thank um, the new nightlife mayor, Ariel Pallets, who's, uh, who's been uh, uh, very responsive uh, to, to trying to figure out how we can best uh, work together. But, uh, but in every New Yorker uh, has a right to know what their government is doing. And and to operate uh, to understand it with a level of transparency what we what we do here and uh, and this is no different so this legislation would, would seek to bring that transparency and um, bring the operations of March into the light of day. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Eugene. Thank you very much, Madam Public Advocate. I rise uh, to invite uh, all my colleagues to a very important event that will take place on Sunday, October 21st, at the Brooklyn Museum at 7 p.m. We are going to celebrate the New York City Haitian Day, a very important day. We know that New York City is a great city, is a powerful city. United States is great because of the contribution of so many people. And what makes us strong is when we celebrate each other, culture, and heritage. Three years ago, we voted in the City Council a legislation to establish October 9 as New York City Haitian Day in recognition of the contribution of Haitian people to the United States of America. I just want to remind people that among the people who have helped or contributed to the United States of America, Haitian people were there too. On, 70, on October 9, 1779, Haitian people came from Haiti and fought alongside the American soldiers for the independence of the United States of America in Savannah, Georgia. I didn't make it. If you go to Savannah, Georgia, you will see a beautiful monument erected to pay tribute to the Haitian people. And also, you, talk, you know about the Louisiana Purchase. It was possible because of the revolution in Haiti, the Haitian Revolution. Because of the Haitian Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte didn't have enough resources to extend his empire. He had to sell Louisiana to the United States of America. And that doubled the size of the United States of America. You, had, you know about Chicago. The father of Chicago is Haitian, Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. He's the one who created infrastructures and many buildings. And now we are talking about Chicago. And uh, also, St. Patrick Cardinal, right here in New York City, the, one of the first people to give funding for St. Patrick Cardinal was Haitian, Pierre Toussaint. So I'm inviting you to celebrate the solidarity of United States and Haiti and the contribution of Haitian people to the United States of America. Remember, Sunday, October 25, at 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you very much. Thank you. And lastly, Council Member Williams. Oh, thank you. This uh, past week, we've seen a bunch of attacks that we've seen uh, what's been called Caroline Store Carol. Uh, we've seen uh, the Proud Boys. By the way, we can't admonish uh, behavior, but there is not two sides or both sides of hatred. We've seen anti-Semitic attacks in Borough Park and last, uh, this a couple of days ago in Crown Heights. I joined my colleague, Council Member Deutsch, uh, to talk about the anti-Semitic attacks. Um, I just want to point out that, one, we cannot hate neatly. And so the best thing to do with these attacks is to stand up and speak about them every time they happen, no matter what community. And my hope is that every community does that and does not wait for its own community to be attacked. Uh, we are in a heightened state. I believe uh, much of this is increasing because of the rhetoric coming directly from the White House and the people who continue to hold him up. My hope is in this city, we'll continue to speak up and speak out against every one of these kind of <clears throat> attacks. And more importantly, these attacks were caught on video. I firmly believe that there are many more that are not being caught on video. We have to be vigilant about that as well. Uh, yesterday, I attended a property task commission uh, talking about the need to address the inequities. Uh, I'm thankful of the commission's hearing uh, because the mayor disallowed myself and three other council members from joining an amicus brief calling on these kind of reforms. Uh, hopefully, we'll continue to push forward and deal with this inequity. Lastly, I want to just salute my uh, Legislative Director Malik Wright, who made 40 under 40. Congratulations to him. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. And now to close, the speaker, Corey Johnson. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. And I would ask that the members who are here today who decided to wear pink, um, I think 
think Councilmember King wore pink, so I think he's organizing a photo <laughs> of all the members who are wearing pink for the American Cancer Society. Uh, so if you could please come up to the front so that you can compliment uh, Councilmember King's suit. He would be most grateful. I or would clash. be most grateful. <laughs> and with that, uh, today's stated meeting of October 17th, 2018 is hereby adjourned. <laughs>